we try to finish the quantum Fourier transform right before we continue let's uh first talk about uh let's review one more time the discrete Fourier transform so that we uh can continue with a quantum Fourier transform which is uh very simple once you know what is discrete Fourier transform right the first thing on the top left is the nth loop of unity omega right this one i hope you can memorize it so you will take the nth root of nth root of one right this is the solution omega equal to the power of uh e to the power two pi i over capital n right just this is just a a symbol that and a very important quantity that you need to uh, memorize that's the first thing right so this is omega. And then last time we talked about the discrete Fourier transform. Discrete Fourier transform, yeah, in engineering, we did a lot of it. We go from frequency uh, time domain to frequency domain, but we don't need to think in this way. Of course, that can help us to understand some of the concepts. Discrete Fourier transform basically is you give me a vector, n-dimensional, capital N x0, x1, right? So you don't need to care about what is the basis as we said before. Uh, let's say the basis is given, right? We don't know how to describe the basis. It's given like x hat, y hat, z hat. Like this is maybe higher dimension and x0 can be complex or whatever. You have this n numbers. You do a discrete Fourier transform, you will change it to n other n numbers. So you see this is very simple. It's just like you're rotating the vector in the space. We map it from one vector to another vector. And that is the discrete Fourier transform. Of course, in engineering, electrical engineering, we usually think of this as maybe this is the signal in the time domain. At different time, each of this value is a discrete time, zero second, one second, two second. You have that much of, uh, let's say, signal. You do the discrete Fourier transform, it becomes the frequency to domain. It tells you for DC, you have so much of signal for one, I don't know how many hertz, right? Depends on the length. You have y, amount, y, y1 amount of signal, right? So that is from, this is the transform. And that's it. And all you need to memorize is what is the definition, right? It tells you that the cave component is just a summation of the components in the original vector x0 all the way to xn. It's just a linear combination. We say sum j from 0 to n minus 1, but it's weighted by the nth root of unity to the power of kj. Okay? So basically, if you are trying to find, trying to find the cave component, then the, j, the contribution from the j vector of the original vector, j component of the original vector, is the omega to the power negative k times j. That's how I write it here, right? So it's just a linear combination of all the uh, components of the original vector times the nth root of unity to the power negative kj. And of course, you need to normalize it to 1 over square root of n. That is the definition, and that's it. I gave you an example. For example, uh, the 12 components of y, right, is equal to the summation of x0 omega to the power negative 0 times 12, because this is how much you contribute to the 12 component. The x1 contribute 1 times 12. The x2, 12, x2 contribute 2 times 12. Omega net to the power negative 2 times 12 to here. Right. And if you go through this carefully, you find that you can also represent this as a matrix because after all, after all the input is a matrix, is a vector because you have n components. The output also, also is a vector. You have n components. And you are transformed or connected by an n by n matrix. And again, of course, uh, it is omega to the power negative ij, where i is the i row and j is the j column. Is this okay? Any questions? Now, if no, then quantum Fourier transform becomes uh, very simple, right? 
Last time we did talk about some destructive con uh, interference, constructive interference, but you just refer to the previous note. How do we define a quantum Fourier transform? It's just a definition. Define, right? So you trust me, it is useful. Quantum Fourier transform QFT, right? Again, this must be a unitary matrix because we're talking about quantum computing, right? All the gate. Quantum Fourier transform is just a gate itself in some sense, right? Although it's a complicated gate. It's exactly the same as what we see earlier. It's divided by 1 over square root of n times the omega, which is the matrix. And what is this omega? This omega is the same as what we had before. I just write it as omega, lowercase omega, i k j this is a short form for the matrix it basically is saying that the elements of the k row and j column right where we see this it means that you find the k row and j and j column by using this equation omega to the power negative i k j And of course, I can make it clearer. What is omega? What is omega, by the way? Can you let me know? What is omega? What do we call it? The nth root of the unity, right? Which is e to the power negative, uh, no negative. But, but all together, you have a negative. I keep the negative. It's e to the power i 2 pi over n. You need to memorize this kj, right? You see, it's the same, right, as the discrete Fourier transform. And I can also write it down in the matrix form, 1 over square root n. And what is this? Start with one, one, because the first row you have k equal to zero. This is one. The first column you have j equal to zero, right? Do we see this? This one is k equal to zero. And this one is j equals to zero. Then of course, then you will get one, right? e to the power zero must be one, right? And then you have the other term, for example, here you have e to the power negative i two pi over n, because this is the first row, first column, so j and k are one, right? And then you just keep filling up uh, the, the matrix and what is this last one what is this element on the lower right e to the power what say again negative 2 pi over capital n times k what is k this case is the n minus 1 row right because this is the end, this is zero row, one, two, three, and this is n minus one. And then what is the column? What is the column number for this one? No, what, what is the column here? Which column is this? You have idea? Huh? N minus one, yeah, very good. This is n minus 1, right? So the way I write it becomes uh, very difficult to see. Let me erase this. Right, so this is all the way to 1. Right. So this is k equal to 0. k 
okay equal to zero right now i want to warn you something very important this one i call it quantum fourier transform right in some textbook and actually quite a lot or the form you see in the internet this is inverse quantum Fourier transform okay so in some textbook they make when you have this form it's called inverse quantum Fourier transform I just warn you for now okay and now later you will see why we choose why we pick one or more importantly what is the difference between these two okay so that is the first thing this is definition of quantum Fourier transform do you see that it is exactly the same as the discrete Fourier transform right I just remind you that the discrete Fourier transform is e to the power negative 2 pi over nkj right let me show you why if now I apply the quantum Fourier transform to a basis vector j basis vector what is that first I need to write down the matrix quantum Fourier transform I have one 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 and then here is omega to the power negative n minus 1 n minus 1 are you okay with what I'm writing here this one are you okay yeah I just copying this one but only just write the first row and last last row right and first code what is j in column representation this is the basis vector what is j how do you write it in a column vector this is the j this means the j basis vector j basis vector how do you write it just one at the j location very good because that is the definition right that is how we write the basis vector right so this is zero zero and then you have a one at the j location and then zero right that's how you write the j basis vector because again what is the meaning of this column vector this part represents we have zero units of zero vector one zero units of one vector here means that i have j units of j vector here means i have zero units of n minus one basis vector that is the definition right we have been using i mean that's how we write the representation now if you do the multiplication with this simple vector right i try to do multiplication first row times this column what do you get the first row times this column you only have the j column will be left over right because all this multiply zero only the j one is there so you if you repeat this you find that you get another vector which is this omega negative zero dot j omega negative one dot j all the way to omega negative n minus one times j because for each row only the j one still there right and the j one is omega to the power negative dot j right because this is row times column so this is zero times zero zero times one eventually zero times j and then second row is what one times zero one times two until one times j and one times j is kept because i have one here the rest is zero do you see this this matrix multiplication basically just to get the j column as the result 
And if you try to write this in the bracket form, this is 1 over square root n. Isn't this is just summation? I call this, how about I call it a k equals to 0 n minus 1. I sum over omega negative kj times k. Why is k? Because these are the, maybe this is a little bit difficult for you. I jump a little bit. This is, this vector is a linear combination of all the basis vector, right? It has omega zero times j, zero times j amount of zero. Let, let me repeat. This is, I have so much of zero, so much of one, and so much of n minus one. So each of this, is associated with the first index, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to n minus 1. That's why you have k and k. And that's why when you sum it together, this one is the same as this one. Make sense? And now if you look at what we learned in quantum Fourier transform, this is same, I mean, same as discrete Fourier transform. In discrete Fourier transform, you look at this again, right? What do we say in discrete Fourier? We say yk equals to 1 over square root n, summation k equal to 0, n minus 1. Uh, let me put xj away. Uh, th uh, this one should not be yk, I'm sorry. This one should be, uh, I should put this as j, maybe, let me call it. Uh, this is a little bit uh, confusing then. Let me put this j, okay? Then you have e to the power negative kj times xj. Right, uh, although I changed the symbol, right? But the point is that they have exactly the same form. Okay, so up to here, I keep doing the math. It would be good if you can follow. You go home and try again. Make sure that you understand uh, how to construct a quantum Fourier transform. But you only need to memorize one thing after all, is that quantum Fourier transform has exactly the same matrix as discrete Fourier transform in my book or in the way I teach, or in some literature, okay? They have exactly the same form, which is 1 over square root n e to a, uh, omega to the power negative ij. It's very easy to memorize. Yeah. Where say again? Which word? Two point seven two. What what do you mean by two point seven two? Which part? Uh, left. Upper right hand corner. Yeah. Well, what's good? Yeah. Oh yeah, that is the uh, uh, exponential. Yes. Two point two point. Uh, that's exponential. Two point seven one two. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, this each is just the exponential, yeah. Okay, so I still have not explained to you what I mean by my, or here, the quantum Fourier transform can be an inverse quantum Fourier transform yet. Before that, I want to look at the unitarity of the quantum Fourier transform, okay? I want to prove that this is unitary. So recall, what is an unitary matrix? U times U dagger equal to I, or then we have U uh, dagger equal to U inverse, okay? So we 
And we also prove earlier or each each column uh, is orthonormal. I don't know if you remember that is a property of the unitary matrix we proved earlier. Each column of the matrix is orthonormal. It means itself, if you do an inner product, you get one. If you do an inner product with other column, you will get zero, right? So for example, for column uh, A, for example, what is the vector in column A? I can call it a vector, right? It's equal to one over square root. So what is the value in column A for, the, for this uh, uh, quantum Fourier transform matrix? What is the value of column A? Is omega to the power negative rho times A, right? Right? So what you get is E to the power negative rho, the zero rho times A, E to the power negative one rho times A, all the way to E to the power negative N. N minus one times A. Very good. Yeah, I said something. It's not E, it's omega. Thank you. I said the wrong thing. It should be omega. Excellent. Right? How about B? In column B. Column B is the same, right? Except now you make it as the B. Because now it's column B. It's again zero row. Zero row is zero dot B. Second is omega negative one dot A, uh, dot B, sorry. All the way to omega negative N minus one dot B, right? Is this clear? So I'm taking the one column from the matrix, right? To form the vector from the QFT matrix. I'm taking one column. If you are, it might be easier to look at here. Uh, I use discrete Fourier transform, but I already show you that discrete Fourier transform is the same as quantum Fourier transform. So if I'm taking column one, this is column one, right? Omega zero times one, one times one all the way, or n minus one times i, one, right? So that's why for column A is zero times A, one times A, n minus one times A. Column B is zero times B, right? Then let's check what they are. What is A in a product B? What is A in a product B? How do you form the bra of A? You will do a transpose, and then what? How do you do the bra of A? Compress conjugate, yes. So you get neck omega zero dot A, Omega 1 dot A, because I do compress conjugate. Now, although 0 and A are real number, but Omega itself has an I there, right? So that's why I get a negative. Omega N minus 1 times A, and then the whole thing times B. Times this whole thing, the B. I'm not going to copy, right? This whole thing, just fill in. Make sense? Now when you do that multiplication, what do you get? Do you get a number, a matrix, or a vector? A number, right? Because I'm doing this bra and cat, right? Row times column. So this obviously is 1 over n, right? And then you have omega 0 dot a plus 0 dot a, 0 dot b. Not plus, I'm sorry, it should be minus. This whole thing plus omega 1 dot A minus 1 dot B, right? And then all the way to omega 
n minus 1 dot a minus n minus 1 dot b, right? Because you're doing the multiplication. Now, I can make it into a sum, actually. This is just equal to 1 over square root n. This is a summation. Let me call it k equal to 0 to n minus 1. Look at this. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to n minus 1, right? So this is just equal to omega k times a minus b. Do you see that? Because this is a minus b times 0, a minus b times 1, a minus b times n minus 1. Then I add them together, it is just the zero changing. So I have k from zero to n minus one. Make sense? What is this? Do you remember? Maybe you forgot. If a equals to b, what is this? If a equals b, this is zero, right? Then we're summing how many terms? How many terms do we have here? N term. So 0, omega to the power 0 is 1. So I have N. So the result is 1. But if A not equal to B, what is this? We learn from the property of N fluid of unity, if you remember. If this is an A not equal to B, then this is not 0 then the whole thing sum up to be zero. Right? Just go back to see the n of unity. If turn out a minus b equal to 1, this is just, just a summation of the n of unity power, right? Remember we did the geometric series? Yeah, go back to take a look. We proved this equation already. And that is the thing. This is normalized. This is orthogonal. So it does show that for every column in this quantum Fourier transform matrix, they are orthogonal to each other. Okay? And because of this, the quantum Fourier transform matrix is unitary. Right? We are not showing by doing this. Actually, you can do this also. Right? But now I just showed that each column is their equivalent. Each column is of a normal to each other. Okay, we did discuss this earlier. Uh, is this okay? Okay. Then I want to talk about the inverse quantum Fourier transform. This is a little bit uh, tricky. We need to do it slowly, right? So quantum Fourier transform we just showed that it is unitary. So it's a joint matrix, right? Must be equals to the inverse, right? But let me do not write it now, actually. Okay, so I will continue to do this. So what is the elements of a quantum Fourier transform? Omega to the power negative kj, right? If I apply the complex con uh, the tr uh, transpose to it, it becomes omega to the power negative jk, right? Because I sw switch the index, column and row. But this is just multiplication. I can keep it as kj if I want, right? Because one times two equal to two times one. J times k equal to k times j. And then I apply the complex conjugate, what do you get? Omega kj. Okay? But since Quantum Fourier transform is unitary. So itself at joint equals to its inverse. Okay, so we call something called 
inverse quantum Fourier transform, we just call that this is just the inverse of the quantum Fourier transform, which is equals to the self-adjoint of the quantum Fourier transform, which is equals to omega kj. Right? So all I'm showing here is that the inverse quantum Fourier transform is just equal to omega kj instead of omega negative kj. That is the only difference between them. Okay? So from here, I already can write down what is the matrix. The matrix, uh, and actually I missed one important thing. Maybe it will confuse you. Uh, I forgot to put the normalization here. It has a, maybe I don't put here. Maybe I just put uh, here as square root n. I multiply the whole thing by square root n. That will be better then. You won't get confused. But here, I will need to write this as 1 over square root n. Okay, so the inverse quantum Fourier transform equals to the inverse of quantum Fourier transforms, of course, 1 over square root n. And then you have e to the power i 2 pi over capital N kj. And this is the matrix for inverse quantum Fourier transform. Now, and then I'm going to say one thing. In some textbook, this is quantum Fourier transform. Do you remember say I said that for my quantum Fourier transform, some textbook call it inverse quantum Fourier transform. So my inverse quantum Fourier transform will be their quantum Fourier transform. Right? So when you read paper, you need to make sure that which equation they are using. The most important is that you use the same equation. It's not how you call it. And next class, I will explain why uh, we have different definition. In short, my is called quantum Fourier transform because we follow the same convention in discrete Fourier transform. It actually transform the vector. And in other textbook, the quantum Fourier transform, which is our inverse quantum Fourier transform, is based on the fact it tell you how it transformed the basis vector, which is how we define the quantum gates, right? Quantum gates is how you transform the basis vector. And that is for transforming the coordinate. So they are in different direction. Okay, so I, I will stop here because of time. Uh, any questions? For the example, I will do it next time. Any questions? Mm -hmm.